Good morning, everyone. First of all, I wanted to let you know I signed another one-month extension to the state of emergency. As a reminder, this is the tool we need for the mitigation measures still in place while we work to protect more Vermonters with the vaccine. But as we discussed last week, when we outlined the Vermont Forward Plan, it won't be long before we're at a point where any adult who wants a vaccine will be able to have one and we can ease restrictions in a measured way. In the meantime, it's still important that folks follow the guidelines in place. Doing so will help us get back to normal faster, help get our kids back in school and more. Yesterday, Dr. Levine and I participated on a call with the FDA and CDC to get an update on the situation with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We now have a uh, better understanding of the timeline because they told us that about half of the J&J &J doses were administered in the last few weeks. That means to get to the bottom of this issue and to have confidence restarting vaccinations, they needed another week or so uh, to make sure uh, that they collected the information needed to make that decision. So while I remain concerned about the pause, especially not knowing how long it could be, we at least understand what they're looking for. And um, so that's uh, a bit reassuring. So, uh, and they'll be meeting again next week where they will learn more and hope we'll be able to return to distribution of the J&J &J vaccine uh, very soon. And finally, this Monday, eligibility opens to all Vermonters 16 and over but there's one change we're announcing today. Tomorrow, those age 16 to 18, our high school students will be able to sign up. As you know, I've made getting kids back into school a priority and this step will help give those kids the opportunity to register for Pfizer doses uh, two days early, which is their only option at this time and possibly enjoy the end of the school year in a much more normal way. And again, on Monday, as scheduled, all Vermonters 16 plus will be eligible for vaccinations. Secretary Smith will go into further details in a few minutes, um, so uh, stay tuned on that. Our strategic uh, phased approach to vaccinations is one of the reasons we rank in the top five for rate of administration. And we were the first state to get to 90% of those most vulnerable, uh, those 65 and over, with at least one dose. Unlike some states, we made appointments based on doses we know we're getting. And it's allowed us to be nimble to react when we need to, like the Johnson & Johnson issue we're dealing with right now. So we really appreciate Vermonters' patience and opening eligibility to all those 16 and old, older will get us one step closer to the finish line. So please sign up uh, to get your shot. There's no excuse not to at this point. The vaccine is our ticket out of the pandemic so we can enjoy time with family and friends, do some normal things, get people back to work, and look forward to what I believe will be a very good summer here in Vermont. With that, I'll turn it over to Secretary French for an education update. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. I'll begin my update by reviewing the results of our weekly surveillance testing of school staff. Uh, this week was a school vacation week for about half our schools, so participation in the testing was off as compared to our normal rate. Uh, this week, we tested 570 staff, which is about a third of the number we normally test. To date, uh, this week's testing has identified no cases of COVID-19, so the positive rate, positivity rate is 0%. Uh, the state positivity rate declined a bit during the same time period and remains low at 1.8%. Daily case counts in schools remain higher than what we saw in the fall. Uh, typically, we are now seeing about 10 to 20 new case reports uh, in schools each day, uh, which certainly hasn't made it more difficult uh, for schools to expand in-person learning. The trend in school case counts has plus plateaued a bit, is leveling off uh, to a certain extent, but it still fluctuates on a daily basis. We do remain confident that as the vaccine is more widely deployed, uh, the ability of the virus to spread in our communities will be reduced, 
uh, which in turn will reduce the number of school cases. In the meantime, uh, we will be publishing some updated guidance for our schools on the contact tracing process to ensure good coordination between schools and the health department. Now, the contact tracing process in schools has been under increased pressure as a result of the higher case counts in our revised distancing requirements. Every month, we conduct a survey that measures the amount of in-person, hybrid, and remote learning our students are experiencing. Uh, we implement the survey at the end of each month. I thought I'd share the results of the March survey today. 85% of our schools responded in the March survey. In summary, uh, the data from March do not show much change from February. About 55% of our students were in hybrid, 33% in person, and the remainder were remote. Again, the survey is given at the end of each month, so these data just represent a snapshot of a specific moment in time. When we break out the data by grade level, <clears throat> elementary students experienced a slight increase in the amount of in-person. In March, it was 52%, whereas in February, it was 50%. Fewer middle school students were in-person, in however. Uh, that percent dropped by 5% to 24%, and the amount of in-person among high school students dropped by 1% to 8%. I think, again, the relative stability in the data shows that the commitment on the part of our school staff and Department of Health to maintain uh, school operations in the face of fluctuating conditions and logistical consideration. Uh, this takes a tremendous amount of work on a daily basis, and I want to thank everyone for their sustained efforts in this area. On another note, uh, we received word that the federal government has authorized the Vermont Department of Children and Families and the Agency of Education to provide a temporary food benefit to pre-K to 12 students would normally receive free or reduced meals at school. Uh, these benefits called uh, pandemic EBT or PEBT will be based on a student's learning model for each month. Uh, the amounts vary based on the ability of students to access meals at schools. For example, uh, the benefit provides $119.35 per student for a remote learning month and $71.61 for hybrid learning months and no benefit for an in-person learning month. The PEBT program provides an electronic benefit card to eligible households to be used for food purchases at participating grocery stores, convenience stores, online retailers, and also farmers markets. Uh, these benefits are meant to replace the value of school meals that children would have received had they been at school. The availability of the PEBT benefit does not have any impact on a child's eligibility for the free meals our schools are making available this year. Families are encouraged to use both resources to ensure children have access to healthy meals. Uh, approximately $14.7 million in benefits will be issued to 21,844 Vermont households uh, for September 2020 through February 2021. Uh, this will cover approximately 33,000 uh, students. Eligible households will receive a letter explaining the benefit all eligible households should receive their benefit by April 29th. Another benefit for March through June 2021 will be issued in July. Uh, this has been a very complex program to implement, and I want to thank uh, the many school staff around the state who work quickly uh, to collect the required data from households and submitted us up, us up to the state level. Uh, this quick work on their part made it possible for us to turn this program around fairly quickly and get the benefits deployed, and we really appreciate their efforts. And the regular supply of healthy and nutritious foods uh, is essential for the growth and development of our children. Uh, this benefit will help ensure students have access to nutritious meals through the end of the school year. Lastly, uh, I wanted to provide a quick update on the development of guidance for graduations and end of school year celebrations. Uh, this guidance is on track for a publication before the end of April. In the meantime, districts can use the Vermont Forward Plan to inform their end of year plans. Our guidance will essentially provide direction on how to operationalize the Vermont Forward parameters in the school setting. We are optimistic uh, that schools will be able to hold many of these events this year, and I think it's really important that we try to end the year on a celebratory note for our students. That concludes my report. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French, and good morning, everyone. As you know, um, Vermont will follow the recommendations of the Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention and extend the pause on the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine for an additional week. The federal pause is in place to allow the CDC's advisory committee 
to the time it needs to gather more data ab about reporting side effects. The committee will meet again next week. This means all Vermont Johnson & Johnson appointments have been canceled through Friday, April 23rd. We have reached out to those that have had appointments scheduled to reschedule. If you have questions or need assistance or you haven't been contacted by the health department, please call the vaccine call center at 855-722-7878. The department is working hard to open as many additional appointments as possible for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and expect every, everyone impacted by this pause will be able to get an appointment by the end of April. We will have some Johnson & Johnson clinics uh, on the schedule after April 23rd, which accounts for about 390 appointments. We haven't canceled them yet, but I want to highlight that at this time, we are not scheduling Johnson & Johnson appointments. Those who have made appointments with CVS or Walgreens should follow the pharmacy's instructions about rescheduling. Anyone who wants to make a new appointment through the state's registration system can call the Vaccine Call Center at 855-722-7878. At this point, we don't feel this week's delay will impact our overall schedule for va uh, vaccine completion. And by July 4th, if Johnson & Johnson vaccines continue, we will open up more slots and offer to move up appointments. We will continue to uh, keep you informed as more information about Johnson & Johnson vaccines become available. Now let's talk a little bit about what the governor announced about opening up registration for the next aged group, uh, 16 and 17 year olds and 18 year olds. The FDA requires that 16 to 17 year olds re receive only the Pfizer vaccine this age group, 16 and 17 year olds, are not eligible for Moderna or Johnson & Johnson vaccine that we received in Vermont. We also want to vaccinate high school graduates who have missed out on key opportunities at a pivotal time in their lives. So we decided to open up registration early for Vermonters 16 to 18 years old beginning this Saturday at 10 a.m. This will ensure that there are enough Pfizer appointments for 16 to 17 year olds. It will also assist high school seniors to get earlier appointments. Please note the different time for the weekend registration it is at 10 o'clock. The entire age group, grouping um, 16 plus, will be available to register online well, everyone that's over 16 will be able to register online uh, beginning on Monday, April 19th at 6 a.m. Again, notice the time. It's a little bit earlier than usual. You can register online beginning on Monday, 16 and above. Uh, so those that are 16 to 29 and above can register on Monday, April 19th at 6 a.m. All of this means that on Monday, all Vermonters age 16 and older will be eligible to receive a vaccine. Again, you can make an appointment through the state's website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. If you are unable to sign up online, you can call the number 855-722-7878. Please remember this that if you are 16 or 17 years old, you will need your parents or legal guardians consent to register and make an appointment. There is, there is a registration box that the parent or legal guardian can check um, in this registration process. Moving on to those 30 and older, we have opened registration this week. Nearly 18,000 people have made appointments and as of this morning, 59% of those in this age group have either been vaccinated or have made appointments. Turning to, the, to BIPOC Vermonters and households, 6,400 individuals have made appointments. We have made uh, progress to close the gap between non-Hispanic whites and the BIPOC community from 13.3% 
which was the gap that uh, I talked about a few weeks ago, to 8.9% when comparing percentage of people vac vaccinated. If you have not done so already, I encourage the BIPOC Vermonters and I encourage BIPOC Vermonters and household members, especially those 65 and older, to make an appointment on the state website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Um, we have seen that 65 years and older in the BIPOC community is lagging for registration, so we encourage 65 and older to please register um, on, uh, on healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or if you're unable to uh, sign up online, you can call 855-722-7878. Please um, press one if you need an interpret interpreter services. Let's talk about the overall pro progress in terms of the overall progress as of this morning. 279,400 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 92,900 have received their first dose of vaccine and 186,500 have received their first and last doses. Just to wrap up a little bit, it's hard to believe that over half of all eligible Vermonters have been vaccinated with at least one dose of vaccine. And that I just announced that in the next few days, all Vermonters will be eligible to be vaccinated. It is remarkable and exciting how far we've come. For example, one year ago, we had limited testing capabilities, but we set a goal to achieve and then we accomplished building our state's testing capabilities to the point that is one of the most robust in the country. Today, any Vermonter that wants a test can get a COVID-19 test, and we urge Vermonters to continue to avail themselves of these opportunities. We have gone from no vaccine just a few short months ago to vaccinating, as I just mentioned, over half of all Vermonters in a relatively short period of time. Of course, there is more to do, and we urge all Vermonters to get vaccinated. But a year ago, we were uncertain what the future would look like. And although we must remain vigilant to stop the spread of the virus as we vaccinate the remainder of Vermonters, the, there is much hope. The light at the end of the long tunnel is becoming much brighter, and soon our lives will return to normal. None of this would have been possible without you, Vermonters, doing your part to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your neighbors from COVID-19. All I have to say is thank you. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Overall, we're not seeing a lot of change in COVID-19 data right now. Daily case numbers continue in their range of under 100 to the close to 200 range. But our seven-day average continues to trend downward and is below 140. Modeling projections continue to look along the more favorable scenarios as opposed to the worst case scenarios. Percent positivity rate continues below 2% at 1.9%. Hospitalization numbers continue in the same range and today are 26 with three in the ICU. Our recent reported deaths are unfortunately bringing us now to 242. As we've discussed previously, that figure represents a lagging indicator relative to spread of the virus in the state, but we do know that the majority in April were among hospitalized individuals. On the very human level, each and every one represents much more than a statistic, and we extend our sympathies to family and friends. I can also share that we've now found variants of the virus in specimens from residents in 10 of Vermont's 14 counties. 
We only sequence a small number of samples at this point, so while we can't assess the true prevalence, at this point we are presuming these variants are circulating throughout the state, making up an increasing proportion of our positive tests. The overwhelming majority are the B117, first detected in the UK. This highly transmissible variant is fast becoming the dominant strain in the country. It at least partially explains why the virus seems to be spreading more easily in the state and is a stark indicator of why adhering closely to all prevention measures is really essential even now, even as we continue to vaccinate as many Vermonters as quickly as we can. Speaking of which, I need to reemphasize what was just said. We have just surpassed 50% of Vermonters age 16 and older having received their first dose of vaccine. And fully one-third of adults are now fully vaccinated. Quite a significant milestone. Seeing those percentages go up every day is really encouraging. Knowing that more and more Vermonters are protecting themselves and each other and getting us all closer to a time when we can move forward living our lives safely. This is progress. The virus is still here and it is spreading, especially among younger Vermonters who have not yet been able to get vaccinated yet. With the benefit of nearly a year and a half of intense medical learning about the virus and how it spreads, my strong advice for those of you traveling for spring break is to go out of your way to follow all of the basic and simple prevention guidance. Rely on what we know works. Wearing a mask, even a double mask, keeping your distance from others, and avoiding crowds. And make a plan for when you'll make your vaccine appointment. Go to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, create your account today so you'll be ready for tomorrow and Monday when the final age groups open up and all Vermonters have become eligible. Finally, I want to follow up on some of what the Governor and Secretary Smith have said about the pause of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. As you've heard, the CDC's advisory committee met Wednesday to reveal data about an extremely rare and severe type of blood clot reported among six of the more than seven million people in the U.S. who've received this vaccine. The committee needed it, uh, determined it needed more time to gather data on the side effects. Whether you received this vaccine already, your vaccine appointment was impacted by the pause, or you are worried that this might affect vaccination efforts generally, I want you to know that I and all of us understand your concerns and frustration. The pandemic has been long and difficult and it's thrown many curveballs along the way. This type of news in some ways can only add to the stress. However, and despite the few cases relative to the number of people vaccinated, it is appropriate and it's important that this committee of medical and public health experts be able to complete its process, to review the data, to provide guidance to the patient's health care providers. This is public health's commitment to safety and transparency, and it's how we build confidence in all vaccines. There are several points I want people to understand about the pause, the J&J &J vaccine, and the actions underway. First, this disorder seems to only have been reported in the U.S. with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The other two vaccines in current use, Pfizer and Moderna, have not been associated with this. You should keep your appointment and feel safe in getting these vaccines. The risk to any one person who received the J&J &J vaccine recently is extremely low. Even so, if you've received the vaccine within the past three weeks and you develop severe headache, abdominal pain, leg pain or swelling, or shortness of breath, contact your health care provider. If it's been more than a month since you were vaccinated, you most likely have passed the critical time for this side effect. There are three key reasons for the pause. One, to elucidate 
or educate clinicians about identifying this rare and novel disorder and the appropriate diagnosis and unique set of treatments, and to allow them to reflect on recent patient encounters and report potential cases that CDC can then review. Second, to educate and conduct outreach with you all in the public. And third, to wait this additional week so that if any of the three million recently vaccinated people are going to develop this, this disorder, it can be recognized and included in the analysis that's being conducted. We will continue to keep Vermonters informed as things progress, and you can stay up to date at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or by following the departments at Health Vermont Facebook and Twitter feeds. I'm hopeful that in the end, we can move ahead using this vaccine with confidence. A one-dose shot is viewed by many as convenient and effective, and from a logistics perspective, has the advantage of being easy to store and administer. A single-dose vaccine may be especially helpful in protecting certain populations who may be harder to reach, such as farm workers or people experiencing homelessness. But regardless of what happens with the J&J &J vaccine, we will continue working with our community and healthcare partners to get these individuals vaccinated with vaccine that is safe and effective. In the meantime, I again thank Vermonters for their patience and support of public health. We've made it so far through so many ups and downs during this pandemic, and we get closer to the finish line every day. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. All right, we'll start with Christina from WCAX. Good morning, Governor. So first I want to talk about the 16 to 18 year old uh, registration opening tomorrow. How do you first plan to reach these 16 to 18 year olds? You are dealing not only with students um, who are under their parents' supervision, who require their permission, um, but are they going to be able to take time out of school? How will schools accommodate that time um, out of the classroom? Is it going to disrupt education? Yeah. I you know, I don't have all the answers to those questions. I believe that uh, Secretary French uh, will be alerting the schools uh, as to uh, to this uh, two-day uh, advance notice, and uh, we hope that students will take advantage of this and find some time within their schedules uh, to make their appointments. So they can be made um, through uh, our healthcare providers, uh, our our pharmacies and uh, the Department of Health and some of our sites that we have set up. So there are a number of different options available, and we just hope that they'll be able to take advantage of those. And again, to reiterate, you know, Pfizer is their only option uh, because of uh, uh, the emergency authorization for 16 and over for just Pfizer. So that's why we wanted to give them a bit of a head start uh, to make sure all the appointments weren't taken by the time they had an opportunity to sign up. To clarify, can 18 year olds not get Moderna then? Or they can? 18 year old can get the Moderna. Okay. Um, and then another follow up question How do you expect the 19 to 29 year old crowd is going to take this news? They now know they are the last to be eligible to receive their vaccine, but there are also the people who work in the service industry and their college students who are displaying uh, very clearly their pandemic fatigue. And I'm among one of those people. Yeah. You know, well, I, I, well, again, um, we've said all along that it was going to be on Monday, um, the 19th, opening this up to this category. Now we've announced that it's going to be a couple of hours early, um, so you have that opportunity. And we're talking about a, a fairly small population of, uh, of those 16 to 18 year olds uh, that, again, we just want to give them just a bit of a head start. Uh, this is a, a milestone in their lives, something that many people remember. Um, their their graduation and we're hoping we're hoping after all they've had to give up over the last year uh, that everyone will have um, some empathy for them and uh, to allow them to have some sort of a normal graduation as a result so we didn't want this to get in the way of them having that not being able to to get their appointments uh, later and uh, we just think it's the right thing to do 
one last quick logistical question, probably for Secretary French, but do you know how many schools will be switching back to in-person learning after April break? I do not know, and I'm not sure that uh, Secretary French knows, but uh, we'll ask him. Secretary French, did you get that yeah, question? Uh, we don't. Uh, Uh, and then the other half next week. So I think, you know, the combination of vacation plus uh, the, you know, the conditions, as I mentioned, are, are fairly challenging right now. I think, you know, a lot of school have, schools have plans, but uh, they're going to make those decisions based on a real situation that they're experiencing on the ground. Yeah, we missed the, the first half of that, Secretary French. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? We can. Yeah, so I was just saying it's, it's going to be challenging to understand that at the moment because we have half the schools out on vacation uh, now and the other half out the following week. Um, but I think, you know, the, the dynamics, uh, certainly the guidance certainly enables more in person, but I think just the challenges of the elevated case counts that we're seeing uh, provide some headwinds into their decision making. So it's hard, it's hard to ascertain, actually, uh, I think, what, what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. But we think certainly as the case counts improve and conditions approved, we will see more in person. Thank you. Um, Governor or uh, Doctor, uh, I was just wondering about the the recent group of deaths and, and hospitalizations. Um, breakdown on ages of those folks, are we still seeing the elderly primarily or are we seeing uh, more of the uh, younger folks being uh, affected by this, especially yeah. in the death rate. I had my concerns as well, so I reached out to Dr. Levine, and I believe he has some answers. My questions were about uh, whether they've been vaccinated, partially vaccinated, or fully vaccinated. Dr. Levine. Yes, thanks, Steve. Um, so, one thing people have to understand is that not every death actually occurred on the day before it's reported um, for various reasons. Uh, the way that deaths are reported both for people who died within state or may have died in another state. Um, the death rate over the course of April right now is certainly trending lower than the preceding three months probably closer to March, but maybe even lower than March, which was the low point in those three months for numbers of deaths. The majority have been people in the hospital. Um, I've not noted any in actually a long-term care facility itself, a couple of people at their home. Some of the people who died in the hospital may have been living in a long-term care facility, but they clearly uh, were hospitalized and died in the hospital. The age range um, goes from um, mostly the 50 to 90 plus age range with uh, a little predilection to the higher age range. There tend to be more females than males. The majority of these are labeled in our system as uh, not fully vaccinated, trying to discern if any of them were partially vaccinated or not, and we'll have that data at a later time, but none of them were fully vaccinated, I, even in the older age range. Again, I think speaking testimony to the benefits of vaccination for sure. And these uh, individuals, unfortunately, did represent a sicker subset of the Vermont population in terms of pre-existing illnesses, comorbidities, as we call it, chronic diseases. Um, and a number of them did, you know, it's always questioned by people in uh, the lay community, did uh, these people actually die from COVID? So in a number of cases, the majority, uh, these truly were from getting COVID in a minority, there were issues with um, having COVID as a disease that they probably died with but not died of. But the majority, COVID was uh, instrumental in that. Thank you. Stewart, NBC5. Mm -hmm. 
wondering, Governor, uh, as you extend a state of emergency, your colleague in New Hampshire has let the mask mandate expire. Uh, what are your thoughts about the difference in the approach between the two states? Well, I think if we look across the country, um, every state has taken a different approach. Uh, we certainly have here in Vermont. Uh, we've done a lot of things that other states have not done. Uh, every governor has to uh, take that into account and, uh, and do what they think is best uh, for their state, as have we here and as I, I have tried to do since the very beginning. Uh, New Hampshire was one of the last to uh, initiate a mass mandate, and they are uh, one of the first um, to, in the Northeast, uh, that is, um, one of the first to, uh, um, to not um, have a mass mandate. So um, I don't know if it's a surprise, uh, but, uh, but we're, we're on course. We have a plan that we rolled out, uh, the Vermont Forward Plan, and uh, we believe by the 4th of July we'll be in much better shape. We can always accelerate if we find that uh, things are getting uh, much better than, than our uh, expectations. Um, but, uh, but at this point in time, we think we're doing the right thing. Can I ask you about those highway signs that uh, were put up several months ago, all telling people they must quarantine or isolate if they enter the state? Are they going to stay up? Uh, no. What are you going to do with them? Yeah. And we, when? We, we will be taking those down. Uh, we talked about that um, earlier. We just haven't gotten to it. And so they'll be coming down and being either uh, uh, replace with uh, another sign or uh, not have any sign at all at, at those locations. Lastly, the the March unemployment numbers and, and employment data came out this morning, and uh, it shows that we, even with this recovery, still had fewer people in the workforce this month than last. What does that tell you? Well, again, you know, we suffered uh, from a lot of those workforce challenges uh, pre-pandemic, and as I've said continuously, uh, those issues didn't magically go away. Um, they're going to be with us uh, after the pandemic is over. So I'm concerned, obviously, about that. That's why all our strategies, that's why, uh, you know, the plan that we laid out for the ARPA money is all about trying to uh, make our lives different, bring more people into the state, more affordable housing, uh, all kinds of uh, initiatives, investments, uh, in order for us to welcome more people back into the state uh, because we need them. Um, Pre-pandemic, as you remember, we had a very low unemployment rate, uh, the lowest in the country, um, but we had more jobs available than we had people to fill them. Uh, that's uh, going to be the case after the pandemic as well. So I continue to be concerned. That's why, again, that's why we're so focused on uh, trying to bring more people into the state. Thank you very much. Lisa, the Associated Press. Lisa, the AP. All right, we'll move to Greg, the county carrier. Good morning, Governor. Um, I was speaking with some people this morning uh, who had appointments for the vaccine, Johnson & Johnson vaccine that were disappointed that their appointments were canceled for, for basically a one in a million blood clot concern. Some of them were wondering why the state forced the, the closures of the cancellation for these vaccines and and didn't allow for those who were willing to take that one in a million risk to, uh, to go ahead with them? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, I know that some were questioning when you look at the, uh, the data, uh, but as we, we've done from the very beginning, we listened to the health experts. The health experts, the uh, uh, CDC and the FDA uh, told us we needed to pause a recommendation. And uh, I don't know as there's been any state uh, who has circumvented that recommendation. Uh, so we think it's the prudent thing to do. It's unfortunate. 
Um, but we think it will be short-lived. We believe by the end of the week uh, they will come out with uh, some recommendations, further recommendations and uh, implement uh, the Johnson & Johnson. But we just thought it was the, uh, the right approach. Again, from the very beginning, we've listened to the health experts, and uh, I certainly wouldn't want to. And we've, you know, we've we cited uh, on, uh, you know, with the abundance of caution that they have as well. So, um, again, we can second guess that, but um, but that's been the approach from the beginning. Dr. Levine, um, sure. maybe I'll just ask Dr. Levine if he wants to add anything to that. One thing I'll say, if there's one message that every young doctor needs to get and have when they graduate medical school, it is three words, do no harm. If you think anything you're going to possibly do has the potential to do harm, you at least need to think about that. You need to have a good discussion with your patient about possible benefits, possible harms, a process called shared decision making so that everyone is educated about it. The medical community and the public health community at large have felt that we need that extra little bit of time to get more information so that we truly cannot do harm. And if the vaccine, even if it provides harm to a very narrow focus of people in the country, that we identify them clearly and understand that before we go further. Keep in mind also, these are vaccines that are still under emergency use authorization, which is not to say that this is a major experiment going on, but it is to say that they haven't gone through as long a time period of being evaluated because of the trials going the number of months they went, and now our experience uh, reviewing the people in the trials months and months later, but also our experience with all of the people in the country and the world getting the vaccine and reviewing how they're doing. So it's a prudent thing to do uh, at this time in our experience with vaccines. I'll, I'll let you ask your next question to the governor. All right, thank, thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, Governor, one last question here. Stuart mentioned a few minutes ago about the labor statistics being announced earlier this morning. Uh, they show that about 10.5% of the workforce is collecting unemployment. Uh, we've already addressed in recent weeks that you're, you're not ready to immediately reinstitute a work search requirement. But we're also hearing from contractors who have projects lined up with the state, with VTRAN, um, that they're having a really hard time getting workers back on the payroll because it's, it's too lucrative to be on unemployment and some of these workers may actually lose money going back to work. Um, will your administration be waiving deadline penalties for contractors who are not able to get workers to come back to work? Um, we'll take that up. Um, obviously, it's a little bit too early at this point in time. Uh, as a former contractor myself, uh, April 15th at this point is still early uh, to get back uh, in the excavation business. So um, uh, it's too soon uh, in some respects to, uh, uh, to um, allow for any exemptions, uh, you know, broadly. Uh, but we'll take, it, uh, we'll take it into account if we see that this progresses. Uh, we certainly will um, we'll certainly contemplate that. In, in your opinion, Governor, what, when's the appropriate time uh, for for contracts to begin? If, if April 15th on a very mild spring is too soon. Well, I can only uh, tell you again from experience. Um, typically in Vermont, uh, May 15th is about when contractors get back to work. That's when most of the uh, uh, the the um, uh, the restrictions on, on back roads are lifted May 15th. Uh, that's when the frost is out of the ground, uh, the mud uh, is dried up, and you can travel on some of those roads. So um, typically around you know May, May is the time when uh, uh, contractors go back to work. I've seen a number of them back to work now. Uh, there's one uh, working on I-89, and, and I know there are uh, many who have uh, been able to do that. So again, I think it's, um, 
we'll take it into account uh, when uh, when we do start up, and if there's a an issue, uh, we'll uh, we'll reflect on that. Uh, I will say uh, the work search requirements, as I've said before, uh, we will be putting those back into place uh, fairly soon, uh, but that's not necessarily going to fix the problem either. Um, but we'll um, we'll be putting that into place fairly soon. Thank you, Governor. Have a great weekend, and I appreciate your time. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. I think these questions are probably for Secretary Smith. What is the status of the almost 6,000 Johnson & Johnson vaccines that are not being administered until the CDC completes its review? Will they be destroyed? Do they have a shelf life? And if so, what is their expiration date? Yeah. We we don't uh, kind of, you know they aren't uh, they don't have a, a a shelf life issue at this point in time. Um, this two week delay will not impact uh, that uh, that supply. Uh, they have stopped shipping us uh, any of the Johnson Johnson at this point in time. But any we any we have in supply is safe, uh, and uh, we'll be able to utilize that once uh, this order is lifted. Great. Thank you. And a reader has asked if we can verify that EMTs who are partnering with the state on COVID testing and vaccine distribution are being paid $40 an hour. Can you confirm that? And are federal coronavirus funds being used to cover this expense? Um, I don't know what the rate is, but I'm sure that we're using FEMA funding and CRF dollars, federal funding, uh, to uh, to uh, pay uh, for that uh, for that benefit. But at least we are using federal funding, FEMA funding particular in this area. I don't know the rate that you have uh, described, but let me do this. Let me have uh, do some research and get back to you. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, one quick follow-up. I believe uh, Dr. Levine indicated this morning four counties are without the variant. Have you been briefed as to which four counties are undetected as of now and which ones are they? I don't have that information, Dr. Levine. I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I can tell you it's on our website because we have a new page about the variants and it shows two columns, the B117 and the B1429, and the counties and the counts of those. Uh, I just can't give you, uh, I don't want to be incorrect at the podium and give you the names and yeah. maybe miss one. Okay. But I would also, I would also uh -huh. say that a county that shows zero, you should assume the number is greater than zero. This virus does not respect borders at all, and um, the sampling process may not have just picked it up in those counties. So I wouldn't want any citizen to assume that as long as they stay home in their county, they're not going to see the variant, because that's not going to be true. Yeah, no, I, I, I think, you know, going back to the very beginning when the town of Georgia was repeatedly reported as having zero. and. Uh, we knew that there had been cases. Uh, I don't think anybody assumes that they're without. But anyway, Governor, uh, an Islander reader is wondering what your administration is doing about preparing for potential approval of the Pfizer vaccine for for 12 to 16 year olds, uh, Vermonters, um, and if the shots will become immediately, uh, they're going to be eligible to register for the vaccination on that approval what is your administration doing for the 12 to 16 year olds yeah this we, point? we um you know we're awaiting that emergency approval and we're also awaiting um, our supply data we have to get through uh, what we've already committed to at this point um, but just as soon as we possibly can uh, we want to be able to implement whatever uh, they uh, allow us to do uh, so that's uh uh, the 12 to 16 year olds would be a great improvement and uh, provide for a greater number of Vermonters having uh, uh, being protected. So we're looking forward to that, uh, but uh, I have no idea when that's going to happen. So 
the, once it's approved, there will be a sign up, but there might be a delay because of the. I I wouldn't say that. It, it, the, uh, yeah, I we just don't know uh, yet, Mike. Uh, again. Um, we'll just implement that just as quick as it comes out and open it up to, as another age group. Um, so as we've opened up the 16 and over at this point in time, uh, we believe that we'll be on a path uh, to open up uh, by July 4th and possibly sooner, depending on the supply of J&J. Um, &J. But, um, but we'll also implement whatever policy they put into place uh, so that we can uh, get the vaccination process started just as quick, quick as we possibly can with the supply uh, in mind. Thank you, as always. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Thank you. Um, I am curious, um, has the manufacture of the Johnson & Johnson been halted as well as the distribution? I know that there was a problem and a likely shortage to begin with, uh, assuming that it is clear to be used again, will the supplies jump because of the uh, lag? Yeah, I can't confirm this. Uh, maybe Dr. Levine has more specific information, but I can speculate. And I would say that Johnson Johnson is continuing to manufacture uh, and because they have confidence in the product uh, that they have uh, uh, put forward and uh, and seeing the results of that. So I would imagine, speculate, uh, that they are continuing to manufacture the vaccine. Dr. Levine? Yeah, that's my impression as well. <clears throat> there was nothing in what the advisory committee said or did that told the company itself what it could or couldn't do at this point in time. Governor, if I could just add a comment on the 12 to 16 year olds as well. Um, all that has happened thus far is Pfizer has put out some uh, media release regarding their very optimistic view of their data. Not that they're distorting it, I don't want to give that impression, uh, in saying that they had great success in their trials. I don't believe that has yet been translated into the application for an EUA, because usually when that happens, there's a lot of fanfare, and we know when the committee is meeting about it, and we're poised to act the day after the committee meets regarding it. So that's the process that will occur. So we'll have some advance notice about that and be easily able to set everything up that we usually do when we open up a new age band. My suspicion will be that isn't happening in the next couple of weeks, and it may not happen till um, even June. At that point in time, there's going to be an abundance of uh, vaccine for every state, and we hope we will not be constrained by the resource allocation process because there'll be plenty of vaccine uh, that might outstrip even the demand for the vaccine so it won't be as challenging to immediately open up a 12 to 16 age band and provide them with the vaccine real time. Thank you. Um, Dr. Levine, I, I've got another one of those questions that I suspect um, you're gonna say, ask again later, but it occurs to me now. Um, I know that there's been ongoing research and I am curious as to whether um, it is becoming clear how long the current vaccines will be good for, at what point someone might need a booster, and also whether the vaccine manufacturers are working to tweak the vaccines that they currently have to uh, perhaps make them more effective against variants? And should that be the case, um, how that might affect the ability to provide um, uh, boosters in the long term or even the near term? Sure. No, those are good questions. And I, I can actually give you a, a pretty good answer. This was even addressed in front of Congress yesterday by uh, 
some of the White House uh, experts uh, in Washington uh, who did not give a uh, highly specific and conclusive answer, but give us a good idea of what's happening. Everyone believes the duration of the vaccine-provided immunity is greater than six months. Most people do believe it would require a booster at some point so that this vaccine will appear to be more like the kind of vaccines we get with some frequency, like the flu shot, as opposed to vaccines we may have gotten in childhood and never get again, um, which is fine. Um, that's just the reality of the uh, kind of virus we're dealing with. <clears throat> with regard to the variants, what's becoming more obvious is even with a variant, and a definition of a variant is essentially the virus has had some mutation in the spike proteins, but there's a lot of those spike protein genetic codes, so each variant only has its very special mix of those mutations. Even with the variants, if you can overwhelm the virus with a large amount of antibody, it doesn't matter which variant you're dealing with, you're going to be overall successful in controlling the ability of human beings to get infected and then transmit that variant strain. So it's keeping the antibody level high enough. And that's the whole concept behind what a booster dose does. It's just boosting your level of antibody uh, when it may have been dipping a little lower than would be uh, as helpful for you in fighting off the virus. Yes, we can tweak the mRNA, and if a Brazilian variant started to become more dominant here, and it seemed to have greater ability to evade the vaccine, uh, yes, people could be provided with that. But again, you don't want to have to have a virus put us in a whack-a-mole kind of uh, posture. And really, the way around that is just to have enough people vaccinated and have each person's level of antibody be sufficiently high enough that vaccine will do exactly what it was designed to do. So that's my answer for today. Thank you very much. Guy Dave's Chronicle from Vermont State House. Uh, Governor, several of my readers are wondering why hospitals are not administering the vaccine to patients. Um, is, is this true? And, if, and can you uh, tell me why? I don't have the answer to that. Uh, maybe Dr. Levine does. I, I would hate that everyone hear a blanket statement that hospitals are not administering the vaccines to patients. You may recall back in the beginning, um, we actually wanted to make sure that hospitals administered vaccines to patients in the age range we were doing in case there was a risk of them wasting doses <laughs> Uh, that they would have some left over for those who were in the hospital. Hospitals are getting some allocation of vaccine right now, and the goal of that is mainly for their emergency room setting, where they may see somebody who is vulnerable uh, and may not actually have any other contact with the healthcare system, and this provides a great opportunity to begin their vaccine process. So that's one aspect. And of course, the J&J &J was especially attractive for that. Hospitals also are occasionally, or perhaps frequently, discharging patients who have recovered from whatever they were hospitalized with to nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. We wanted to make sure there was a ready way for those patients to have vaccine. Yes, we could deliver vaccine to the nursing homes, et cetera, et cetera, but this is really nice to be able to build it into a healthcare encounter, if you will, like a hospital stay is. So no, we're not encouraging hospitals to become the prime vaccinators right now. We have a huge pharmacy workforce, we have a huge state public health workforce, and we have all of our mass vaccination sites often of which they are partnered with hospitals to carry out their task. But uh, the hospital itself doesn't have to be a major component of the vaccine strategy now. So is that clear? 
Um, yes, I guess what you're saying is there are situations in which the hospital will, but it's not the uh, it's not first resort for people. Perfect. It's not an automatic. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, Governor, uh, last year you were a big supporter of, of Vermonters supporting the media uh, during the economic downturn. Uh, a couple months ago, Governor Welch, uh, <laughs> sorry, Congressman Welch, on a uh, during a House hearing, called for uh, a new model of government funding of the media. I guess not unlike the BBC and other other uh, organizations. What do you think of that idea of, of government, direct government support of the media as a as a business model? Yeah. Well, I'm a capitalist at heart, so um, I think the model we have, as frustrating as it can be at times. Uh, with a lot of the polariz polarization that we're seeing uh, amongst uh, all sectors, including the media, um, I still believe that's the best model to use. I don't think the government should run that. Thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, follow up to Stuart's question earlier about the mask mandate. Uh, uh, you said each state has to do what it thinks is best, uh, but I recollect in the fall a surge in Essex County cases being linked to the cross-border interaction with New Hampshire. Um, how concerned are you, uh, given the late stage of the pandemic here, that decisions being made in other states will be felt in Vermont, especially a corner like Essex County that has low vaccination rates, older population, and, and now presumably interaction with uh, New Hampshire folks that might not be adhering to the guidance um, as well. Um, you know, I would say that um, my concern uh, about that uh, other states and what's happening in other states has been my concern from day one. Uh, as you might remember, uh, there was a, quite a spike in New York and Boston in particular, and that's where we saw a lot of growth, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut as well. And uh, we saw a lot of cases, a lot of deaths as a result. And we tried to protect ourselves as best we could with our travel policies. Um, but uh, I'm you know, comforted in some respects uh, by the fact that we have a high in, uh, uptake of, uh, of those who want uh, the vaccine uh, here in Vermont. That isn't the case in every state, but, uh, but there seems to be a lot of demand uh, here in the state. Um, and so we're trying to, to protect Vermonters as quick as we possibly can uh, with the limited supply that we're receiving. Um, so that's what will save us. And, uh, and from my perspective, uh, why we need to continue with the uh, other guidance that we put into place, the mask mandates being one, uh, that we want to continue that until everyone is substantially vaccinated. So we'll continue with our approach. and. Uh, we believe that uh, Vermonters uh, should have some self-responsibility as well and protect themselves and their families and utilize the, co the uh, guidance that we have in place, including wearing a mask. Uh, thank you. Uh, shifting gears, uh, perhaps for Dr. Levine, uh, guidance um, for uh, high schoolers that uh, could potentially start receiving uh, doses if they're lucky with scheduling as soon as this weekend, um, if they have some of the common side effects uh, from the dose, uh, like um, soreness, sore throat, sneezing, those types of things, uh, is the advice uh, in an abundance of caution for them to stay home until that clears, or can students go to school um, even if they have some of those mild side effects? Yeah, very timely question, Andrew. Um, I. I don't want to be a contributor to any uh, potential absenteeism rate issue, but I do believe the high school student should follow the guidance that we've been giving everybody all along. So if they have symptoms that are concerning to them, that could be vaccine side effects, but could also be uh, related to COVID infection, um, they owe it to their uh, community, their school community, uh, to stay home for the day. Uh, we're not finding that People in the workforce at higher ages are having to take abundant time off from work because of side effects from the vaccine. It's not unusual for someone to feel uh, some of these for a half a day or a day uh, and um, take that time off. 
And in fact, our initial counseling to people has always been um, we didn't want their entire workforce vaccinated at the same point in time just because of the fact that we don't want to have high absenteeism rate all at once. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Derek, seven days. Yeah, um, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I'm wondering if uh, this early vaccine registration for high schoolers is, is actually going to expand uh, in-person learning. Uh, and if that's the goal, it would seem to me the, the way to do that would be a, a more concerted campaign, for instance, like clinics on campus next week or maybe last week, more than just opening registration a little bit earlier. Yeah, you know, we considered that and uh, went through that. We we had hoped uh, that we might be able to provide uh, for vaccination clinics on campus at high schools. and, and uh, But it got um, somewhat um, from a from a logistical uh, standpoint, uh, it got to be problem problematic, um, having to make sure that they registered, having to make sure that they have authorization from their, their parents, uh, and then having to prioritize. We have a lot of high schools in, in the state, and we can't get to them all at the same time, so then we'd have to make the decisions about uh, where do we go first, and what's the uptake there? What's the response going to be? So. Again, we went through that and we'd hoped that we could put a plan into place, but it just would have taken away from all our other efforts. Um, so we thought uh, this was the best approach. And, uh, and uh, again, we, we, had, um, we considered doing what you, had, uh, what you had said, but it just didn't work out. Yeah, so do you think this will expand in-person learning or is this more about um, you know ensuring there can be in-person graduation? Yeah, from our standpoint, uh, I think it's more about the graduations because when you think about the, the two-dose uh, um, vaccines, um, it takes, you know, first dose, 30 days later, second dose, then two weeks after that. So uh, at that point in time, uh, we're getting into uh, close to, to June, uh, well into May. So, uh, again, that's our uh, that's our hope. Graduation. Okay. And and is there a is there a public health case to be made for um, moving uh, 16 to 18 year olds up here? I know that you know the 20 to 29 category is where we've seen the highest case rates. Those those folks are more likely to be working public facing jobs or live in congregate settings on campus where, where the virus can spread more quickly, I, I would think. What, is, is, is there a public health case for this? Well, we again, we're going to open up 16 and above um, on Monday anyhow. So this is just giving them two days uh, advance uh, notice, so to speak, uh, so they can sign up because they only have one option, the Pfizer. And we just thought it was the right thing to do. but. Uh, Maybe Dr. Levine can answer the other part of that. that that's exactly true, Governor. The, the public health, health equity case to be made is to make sure that they have access to the only vaccine that they can possibly uh, be administered, which is Pfizer. Um, everyone else registering in the age range you're talking about uh, will have choice in their vaccine because it's not age determined. But this group, it's specifically age determined. So that's our intent, and um, it should be successful um, in accomplishing that goal. Great, thank you. And, and lastly, uh, is this a is this a, a decision that the state's vaccine implementation advisory committee discussed and recommended? I don't believe this was one of the things that they uh, recommended. Um, I'm sure they would agree with me, knowing who's on there, that uh, from an ethics and health equity standpoint, it's the right thing to do, if I could speak for them. Uh, but um, that's all I can say. OK, thank you. Eric, the time's Argus. Yes, Governor, we heard from the head of a school wanting to know how the Vermont Forward Plan will protect children who don't have the option to get vaccinated. She expressed concern about the variants and how they may affect children. Um, the move from going uh, mask mandate to a recommended mask down the timeline. 
Um, and a direct quote from her, I'm feeling very vulnerable as a school leader who is in charge of keeping these children safe at a school without a lot of support to do so. Well, again, we will be providing guidance at that point uh, when the emergency order ceases to exist. And part of the guidance will be in those situations, I would imagine, uh, to have those who are not vaccinated to wear a mask in those situations. But uh, we will be contemplating that and giving the guidance the best we can. Um, and hopefully uh, by that time, there will be more options available for a younger population to be vaccinated. So uh, again, it's a, it's a while between now and, um, and September. And uh, I think things will change dramatically uh, in, the, in between that time. And we believe as well, um, and again, this is a more of a question for Dr. Levine and maybe Dr. Kelso from an epidemiologist uh, standpoint, um, but we, we hope that we're uh, reaching herd immunity at that point uh, and that we will be able to um, suffocate, stifle the, uh, the rate of spread of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, variants as well as the um, transmission of this disease. And I know you've uh, spoken about this before, about the push and pull of opening too fast and not opening up fast enough. What would you say to those who feel this uh, reopening plan is too risky? Um, which which plan are you uh, talking about? Do you mean the Vermont Forward plan? Yes. Well, again, it's uh, it's based upon the vaccination rates. It's done in steps. Um, we believe uh, that this is uh, prudent. And when you look across the country, we're still uh, one of the more cautious states and uh, as has been reflected with uh, New Hampshire's announcement, uh, this just isn't our approach. So we've been doing things, I think, fairly well here in the state. And uh, we're continue, continuing um, with the same thought process. And uh, we think this is a methodical, strategic, and safe way uh, to reopen, to get to a point where uh, we're back to normal. I'd like to uh, have Dr. Levine answer uh, the question, your previous question as well. You, you might be interested uh, to know that, I guess it was eight o'clock this morning, the governor asked me specifically about the variants and the fact that we were seeing more infections in kids and is there something about the variant with regard to kids. Uh, and since that time, I've been able to do a little bit of research as well as speak with some of my uh, academic clinical infectious disease colleagues. And the consensus is pretty much that the variants have an increased rate of transmissibility across the age spectrum. So it's not a surprise we're seeing it in this pediatric population as well, but it's not unique to that population, nor is there something from human physiology standpoint that has currently or yet to be worked out that would indicate that there'd be a unique susceptibility in the kids to the virus that we're talking about um, and to the variant strain specifically. So uh, that's sort of uh, input on that. I might also add, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, masking and mask mandates and what have you this morning. And the governor and all of us and the team would not have um, been um, recommending a mask mandate if there wasn't scientific evidence that a mandate does give you some incremental benefit uh, in the power of masking in preventing more transmission of infection. But I don't want people to forget the fact that even without a mandate, just masking is the concept here. And masking is still a very powerful um, intervention and mitigation strategy as we've shown over and over again. Um, I feel like this is a, a first President Bush kind of message about read my lips, but we've been talking about Governor Sununu and all the focus has been in the headline on the mask mandate is gone. But if you actually heard what he said and what his public health team is saying constantly, it is still wear masks. It's just we've taken the mandate away. He hasn't taken away the emphasis on the power of masking and the evidence that masking can be helpful to the population of New Hampshire. 
So we hope they'll listen to that because uh, as the previous questioner, I guess Andrew was asking about Essex County, we are concerned about that and we'd like to see um, our improvement in rates continue. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, a couple more things on that while I'm thinking of it uh, in defense of New Hampshire. Uh, they took a different approach as well in some of their communities uh, have mass mandates in place and uh, will continue to have mass ma mandates in place. I think Hanover being one. So I don't know how many others uh, throughout New Hampshire have those, but uh, those are community-based. Um, as well, I just wanted to again uh, remind everyone with our Vermont Forward Plan, this was put together uh, in conjunction with uh, our whole team uh, and our health experts. And so we wouldn't have moved forward with this uh, without their approval, without their insight, and uh, without their recommendations. So we all feel strongly uh, that this is a safe approach and that uh, it uh, is based on uh, a strategy that we've been using since day one and, uh, and the number of vaccinations and the supply of vac vaccine coming into the state, and we feel good about it and uh, that it's safe. Okay, thank you. Michael, VT Digger. Hi, I wanted to ask another question about New Hampshire. Uh, starting on Monday, they are allowing uh, anyone to get vaccinated there, regardless of residency, which means that uh, for some Vermonters who live on the border, uh, that may end up being a, a viable option for them to get the vaccine sooner. Is this something that you would encourage people to take advantage of? And is the state planning on publicizing that as a potential option for people in these border communities? Yeah, well, again, up in the Northeast Kingdom, we have made a deal with uh, a hospital uh, there in Colebrook uh, to administer vaccines for Vermonters. So um, trying to find if you live on the border and there's a vaccine site available and they have uh, supply, uh, then I think uh, they should. Uh, and it seems as though maybe New Hampshire has more supply than demand. I don't know that for sure. Uh, but uh, but if they're opening up to a, a larger sector, um, they should uh, maybe give it a try. But I I have a feeling uh, that uh, with their appointments, they may be stretched out uh, into maybe May or June uh, at this point in time. But but we'll see what happens when they open it up uh, to everyone. Um, we're hoping uh, again by the end of the month if we get uh, the Johnson Johnson back online. Uh, we'll be doing somewhat of the same thing. I think we, we had announced, uh, I think it was the 30th of uh, April, uh, that we are going to open it up uh, to those uh, who have, um, are coming back to the state, second homeowners, as well as those uh, uh, in, uh, in universities and colleges who are even going back home for the summer uh, to sign up so they can get, at least get uh, their first dose while they're here. So we're, uh, we're doing the same thing, but we don't have the supply. It doesn't appear that we have the supply that they do, maybe because the the demand that we we have um, are, are experiencing. Got it. Thank you. Cat WCAX. I have a couple of clarifying questions. Are the federal pharmacy partners also ready to sign up the 16 to 18 year old group tomorrow? Yes. Great. And will the state be releasing more vaccine appointments tomorrow? I know some people in different areas of the state have told us appointments are booked a little far out in their area. Secretary Smith. Kat, we will be uh, releasing uh, Pfizer appointments tomorrow for those uh, 16, 17, 18 year olds as well. For the 18 year olds, they'll, they'll have a, a more, um, more appointments available to them. How many appointments are going to be available tomorrow? I don't have that in uh, right at my hand, but we'll be we will definitely be opening Pfizer appointments. I'll, I'll get that for you. Awesome. And do you expect that there will be a high vaccine uptake among the younger age group? Um, we know some research showed up to maybe 20% of people 18 to 24 didn't really plan on getting the vaccine. That might have been a national number, though. Yeah, what I, compliance, I guess, do we expect among the most young people with this? I mean, using um, Commissioner Pichek's um, uh, data that he's been showing, we expect a high uptake along all the age groups. Uh, obviously, this is the age group that we're concerned most about. 
uh, because you think you're invincible at, at this age, um, at a younger age. So I'm hoping that we have the uptake based upon the, the survey data that we have accumulated. Secondly, I just want to say we aren't just sort of sitting by. We are communicating out uh, on the benefits of a vaccine. And as I've said before, our, our plan is to have Vermonters of that age telling other Vermonters of that age why this is important to get vaccinated. So I hope um, through parents, through legal guardians, through uh, friends and associates, uh, because they won't listen. Um, people are, tend to listen to their peer groups uh, through friends that they will listen and get vaccinated. And that's our hope here. Um, I, I think we'll see a, a, a fairly significant uh, uptake compared to the rest of the country. Last one. Do we know how many people are in the 16 to 18 age group? Yeah, I, I'll get that for you too. I think it's, um, I don't remember uh, exactly what it is, but I'll get that to you as well. Thank you so much. Devin Bates, Local 22, Local 44. Yeah, I had a question. Um, if we are looking at booster shots of the COVID-19 vaccine um, a, a year from now, what might the outreach for that look like to try to get the strong turnout we're seeing right now? Um, you know, if an entire year goes by, it might, might not be top of, top of mind as much for some people. Um, you know, if somebody had an account made with the Vermont Department of Health website, could that be used to then contact them again? Um, and get that direct contact if they uh, need the booster shot. Uh, has there been any thoughts on that? I would imagine that we have a strategy in mind, but Dr. Levine can answer that. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, we should all hope that a year from now, this is not the only thing we talk about and that it's not front page headlines all the time and we're tracking everything the same way. We will still be tracking a lot, but hopefully it will be a little more in the background. Um, what you're missing in the question is the fact that probably sometime, if I could guess, over the summer, um, there's going to be a definite transition of vaccination strategy back to where it always has belonged, which is in the healthcare community in the primary care and specialty care offices around the state. Um, that's the way vaccination has always been done for everything. Um, and that will still happen. Not to leave the pharmacies out. The pharmacies will still be a core component of that strategy as they have become for many other vaccines. But you will not have to see large vaccination sites um, that are coordinated through the registration system we're doing right now should a booster become part of our future. It will be just like when you needed to get your flu shot every year, you made a decision. It was either in the context of uh, having health care at a certain site and you just went to that site to get your flu shot, or it was when you were going to have your other medical problems followed up on, and they said, you want your flu shot today? And you said, sure, let's get it out of the way. Or you went to the pharmacy because that was the way you had traditionally done it. So that's what will happen if and when boosters become the rule with COVID-19. Great, thank you. Aaron, BT Digger. Uh, hi, can you We heard the first part of um, that. Yeah, hi. Um, so the state's reopening guidelines for schools assume a three-part distance between students, which is based on the, uh, you know, CDC guidelines that say, you know, we can go from six to three feet. However, what the state's guidelines don't account for is that the CDC allows three feet of distance if and only if the risk of transmission is low based on cases and positivity rates. And right now, the CDC is saying that the risk of or level of community transmission in several counties is high. Is the state concerned about that CDC rating and that portion of the CDC guidelines? Are you are you adjusting for that fact at all in your guidance? I, I'm going to ask Dr. Levine uh, to answer that first, and maybe uh, Secretary French afterwards. 
Yeah, no, no one is ignoring that by any means. And the way the CDC does it for the schools is similar to what they do for long-term care visitation, which has to do with the percent positivity rate. Um, and there's different colors for different percents. Um, uh, goal is clearly to be well under 10 percent and certainly well under 5 percent. <clears throat> Part of what you need to understand, though, is the concept, again, of looking ahead in time and where we're going to be at the time that this thing happens uh, because what is true in terms of case numbers and positivity today, we truly do anticipate is going to be different later uh, in the school year of this, this part of the school year, the spring, uh, and certainly during the summer and then into the fall. Uh, so again, no one's got their head in the sand ignoring uh, that part of the CDC guidance, um, but it's again, you have to plan and anticipate as well. Secretary French? Yeah, I would, I would just add, um, we, as to Dr. Levine's point, we certainly uh, and his team analyzed that very closely. It is an intersection of two variables in the CDC guidance around uh, case counts per uh, population size and also on positivity rate. And then the guidance goes on to say if you pick the higher standard, depending on which one is, is more relevant in that regard. But I think it's also important to understand that uh, we also increasingly rely on our experience and we have real world data and Vermont uh, was operating at three feet at the elementary level uh, all fall, well before the CDC moved its guidance. So we, we have an understanding of that and we have a keen understanding of, of how our schools are situated and their ability to implement guidance with fidelity, which is also another important consideration. So yeah, we certainly uh, took that into consideration, analyzed the reports behind the CDC recommendations, but as Dr. Rothine mentioned, also have to then translate that into a projection of where, where the state will be in the coming weeks and uh, do what we think is best for Vermont. I'm not sure I understand. Are you saying that the fact that we don't currently meet that CDC guidance is okay because you predict that we will in the future? Not quite. Uh, we evaluate the CDC recommendation, as Dr. Levine said, um, you know, and it is a recommendation, so that's important to acknowledge. But I would say that, um, you know, previously we were operating at a lower standard than the CDC recommended, and we have real-world data suggests that that could be done safely. And that essentially are the conclusions of several of the studies, and particularly the Massachusetts study that was behind uh, the CDC change in regulation that basically pointed to there's no significant difference between six and three feet. So all that has to be taken together and evaluated. And that's, I would say, you know, what we've always done uh, successfully to date is to uh, to consider anything, certainly from the CDC and other studies, but then apply it to our real-world context of Vermont. So just to be clear, even if, you know, even if the data or the numbers in Vermont go much higher, you're not going to kind of go back to six feet, even, even you know, if the CDC guidelines would very much call for that under that instance because of the data in Vermont? Yeah, I don't think it's as simple as that. We certainly wouldn't hesitate, as we have in the past, to uh, modify our guidance if we thought it was necessary. But I think, you know, it's also important to note that uh, we have areas of the state that are very sparsely populated. So, uh, take Essex County as an example. A couple, uh, you know, increases there can really uh, skew skew the sort of population uh, uh, counts per uh, on a density basis. So we just have to once again really understand the findings uh, from the Vermont context. Okay, thank you. Liam, CPR. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, in regards to opening up the, the vaccination sign-ups a little bit early for people in, in high school, um, you're talking about how there, there's a certain amount of health, that, you know, a public health equity argument to be made since people 16 and 17 can only get one of the kinds of vaccines. and. Um, you know, and I'm wondering a little bit about uh, an ask that was made last week by restaurant uh, workers to get vaccinated a little bit early. And, you know, that tends to be a, a younger population who are more at risk of, of, you know, contacting people in the public and being exposed to the virus. So I'm just I'm wondering sort of from an equity standpoint why you didn't prioritize uh, 
public facing people like grocery store workers and restaurant workers, but um, did for, for younger high school students. Well, again, I think I explained that uh, fairly well. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for them as they graduate from high school. I'm sure you can relate to that uh, probably better than I can. You're probably closer to that memory uh, than I am. Uh, but that's a big point in, in your life. And uh, to, to have an opportunity uh, for us to allow that to happen for kids, for a kid to, to be able to participate in their graduation, have something normal in their lives after all they've given uh, over the last 14 months, uh, seem to be you know, a, a, a compassionate, empathetic uh, way of looking at this. And, uh, and I understand uh, the urgency of some uh, from an economic standpoint uh, to, uh, to have restaurant workers and retail uh, workers uh, get to the front of the line as well. But we're not talking about that many people getting to the front of the line here. And again, to make a difference in their lives, this once in a lifetime opportunity, I think is a sacrifice uh, that uh, many would be willing to make. But um, but that's just our stand. That's our thought process. Uh, I know that there's some uh, who might uh, disagree, uh, but that's the path we took. You know, I mean, I. I I am certainly a little bit closer, I guess, to my high school graduation and uh, that once in a lifetime opportunity. But I think, you know, a lot of these people, the economic livelihood probably outweighs outweighs that, or I think some might make that argument. So, you know, and I and also just the, the amount of spread that has has been occurring recently. I think. Do you think that the state could have maybe slowed the spread? And we know oh, that you know I, deaths are a lagging indicator as well. Yeah, I, 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 I'm again, just wondering if, if there's again, an opportunity yeah. to miss. To, to reduce spread. Liam, I think, I think uh, we have to go back as well uh, to looking at the data. And the data really doesn't support uh, that there is spread within, the, um, within restaurants at this point in time. Um, it seems elevated, the, the, the transmission seems elevated because of the variants uh, that we're seeing throughout um, all sectors uh, at this point in time. It's not just there in uh, in the restaurants, uh, you could point to, uh, I look at the number of gatherings that I see on the Epi, Epi report, um, that uh, that's where uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, the spread of, these, of the virus. I see it in, in uh, all kinds of different uh, uh, businesses, whether it be uh, auto dealers or be it manufacturing or be it uh, any uh, type of, uh, of uh, business. So it's not pointing directly at uh, restaurants, uh, and I think that that's the fallacy in the argument. Uh, this is spread amongst uh, the whole community of those from 16 to 30 at this point, and we're opening that up on uh, on Monday. This is just to give a little bit of a head start to those who aren't going to have any choices. Now remember as well, I mean, the 16 to 18-year-olds only have one choice, that's Pfizer. Uh, on Monday, uh, there's two choices. There's you know, I mean, there'll be Moderna and Pfizer. And hopefully by the end of the week, uh, there'll be another choice uh, back to Johnson & Johnson. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, but again, from an equity standpoint uh, and trying to be sympathetic uh, to those who um, may be able to, to experience this, again, this milestone in their life after all they've given up over the last 14 uh, months seems to buy, be a... Uh, a price many would be able to to uh, see their way in paying. So I, we'll see how it works out. Uh, I don't. Again, we'll get the numbers, but I don't think it's going to be uh, as big a number as might as some might expect. But uh, but we just wanted to give that that opportunity to those who again have uh, sacrificed so much. Thank you, Tim from my Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I understand that H315 is uh, sitting on your desk, and I'm wondering what uh, your plan is for it. Yeah, I have until tomorrow uh, to make up my mind on that. Uh, there are a number of areas uh, that, uh, that are problematic within the bill, um, but there are a lot of uh, good uh, aspects of the bill, some of, the, some of which we asked for. As you remember, uh, this was as a result of uh, we had put some of these provisions 
in this budget adjustment back in January, and uh, the legislature decided to create another bill uh, so they could put it through quick, quickly. Uh, and here we are, you know, two months, uh, two months later, three months later, um, talking about this bill, and they've, it's been a bit of a Christmas tree. Uh, there's a lot uh, in there, and, uh, and again, as you well know, one of those provisions is really uh, contemplating uh, the taxing of PPP loans, uh, and that's, that's problematic from my standpoint. The other is using um, some of the ARPA money uh, that uh, uh, for different areas when we have no idea whether or not we can use it for that. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, things in there that, uh, that I have problems with. Um, I'm going to reflect on that uh, through the rest of the day and tomorrow and then uh, come, to come to a conclusion and a decision. Now with the, the PPP, of course, which is one of those problematic areas, is that something that um, that that in a, say in the budget bills that could be uh, basically removed yes. without having to yeah it say, can veto? Okay. it can be and that's uh, part of what I'm uh, contemplating but uh, I haven't received any assurances from the legislature that they're going to do that I've heard some say uh, that it could be done uh, I haven't had anyone tell me that's what will be done and there's a difference okay. And with uh, F10, which has the, uh, you know, as you know, the, uh, a lot of people are con very concerned about the, the unemployment um, uh, tax implications of that, and which would boost the, the, the trust fund to a billion dollars, even though we're only have netted 300 million during the pandemic. But um, is, is there any movement on that, on, on um, how to basically fix that, that part of F10? Yeah, well, there's a way to fix it, um, and that's to narrow the scope. Uh, and I would advocate that they do that. But, you know, I haven't been following that, uh, to be honest with you, Tim. I know it's in the House, but I just haven't been following the bill. Okay. All right. I'm sure we'll hear more. Thank you, Governor. Avery, WCAX. As we see more cases among children, are any of the hospitalizations in youth under the age of 16? I don't believe so, uh, but uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. Yeah, I can't be precise, but I'm not aware of hospitalizations in that age group at this time. Okay, um, and I just have another question directly from a viewer emailed. Um, a 70-year-old Vermonter is vaccinated and just wants to know whether it's safe for them to eat indoors and whether you, Dr. Levine, yourself would eat indoors uh, if you could in Vermont, following all the restaurant guidelines, obviously. Sure. So 70-year-old um, that's been fully vaccinated, um, the, the low-hanging fruit is gather with other, un, with other vaccinated people as a very safe activity, can begin to gather with unvaccinated people. Uh, one household at a time and use masks. Obviously, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, is free to go to an indoor dining experience, whether it's at someone's home or in a restaurant, um, knowing that um, at this point in time, no one has come out definitively saying that the transmissibility of virus from one person to another um, is reduced by vaccination, but we fully believe that's going to come about very soon because uh, the data keeps accumulating in that direction. Um, at this point in time, there's a lot of virus around, so I have to be honest, uh, I'm waiting for my favorite restaurants to have their outdoor experiences and under the tent experience, which in spite of the weather today should be just around the corner. So uh, that, that's what my preference would be. Uh, but I could not tell somebody who's 70 and vaccinated that they should not go to a restaurant. Uh, it's again, their own personal level of comfort, their own willingness to adhere to all of the uh, guidance that uh, we all provide all the time. Okay, thank you. Craig, the Bennington Banner. Thank you. Uh, Governor, I have another um, legislation question for you. 
Uh, last night, the uh, legislature, or the House, uh, passed through a bill that had a um, that included um, a uh, ending the tax exemption on cloud computing services or software as a service, but also restructure the corporate tax to move to a single factor um, rather than um, gross receipts rather than um, property and payroll and also passed a $10,000 exemption for military retirees under benefits. Uh, so there's a combination of things there, and just wonder if, if that, if that um, survives the Senate and comes to your desk in that form, uh, how, do you, how would you uh, balance those things out, and do you think you'd sign it? Yeah. Um, well, it has a long ways to go, uh, obviously. Uh, to a couple things. Yeah. I'm, I'm opposed to uh, a cloud tax. Um, I don't think that uh, a $10,000 exemption for military pensions is enough. I think it should be a full exemption. Um, and uh, what was the third one? The third one was the change in the, um, the corporate tax factor from, uh, from payroll and uh, property to uh, gross receipts, sales, yeah. if you will. I, I haven't looked at that aspect, um, but, um, but I... We'll see where it goes uh, when it goes to the to the Senate, but I I would say I, I have some problems with many aspects of, the, of that bill. All set, Greg. Yes, I am. Thank I am. Thank you. Tom, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Um, Will you get your next update on where they're going with the Johnson and Johnson uh, vaccine and the, if they're going to continue to pause it on Tuesday or will you possibly get any information before then? Um, I don't think we'll get, I mean, we'll probably be updated with our White House call on Tuesday, uh, but I don't think they will tell us anything conclusive at that point. I, I don't believe they're meeting, I've heard uh, two separate uh, uh, scenarios. I. I I'd heard that they were going to meet on Wednesday, but I'm being told that it may be Friday. So um, I don't know as we'll know until the end of the week um, before the advisory committee actually meets. And so they are the ones who are going to have to make a, a decision or a recommendation. And then I'm not sure if it goes uh, to the FDA and CDC uh, because there's just an advisory panel. But uh, as, as we've uh, seen uh, over the last uh, number of months, uh, whatever the advisory panel does, uh, the CDC uh, and the FDA will follow suit. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one's a hardball, so brace yourselves. Uh, did Dr. Levine author the masks on faces, six foot, uh, six foot faces? <laughs> I, I don't know. That's a better question for him. The answer is no. It, it takes a village to come up with things that that are that powerful. And we have an ex excellent communication team and marketing team uh, who all contribute to that effort. So it's a product of Vermont. Oh, I would say yes. Okay, that's all I have. Have a great weekend, thank you. Lisa, the Waterbury Roundabout. Thanks, Jason. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Hi, folks. Um, that's a tough one to follow. Um, I'd kind of like to pick up on where um, Aaron was asking about um, the school question and, and Governor Scott's theme of how, you know, the kids have, have paid a long price here for the last year or so, um, and we want to sort of finish on a, on a good note, especially with the um, older kids, I suppose. But there are students on vacation right now this week and then there are more going on vacation next week and they will be returning either Monday or a week from Monday back to their schools and in many cases especially the kids that are in seventh to twelfth grade are going to be coming back to bigger classes at closer proximities because of the three foot rather than six foot rule um, but the I, I guess what I'm hearing a lot and people are looking for some reassurance and understanding and maybe Dr. Levine can explain if there's science behind this is the no quarantine and kids can come back to school um, and get a test three days after they return from travel. 
Um, there are families where adults are vaccinated and the kids aren't, but they're going to go and visit grandparents and family members over their, their spring breaks. Um, so there's going to be kids coming back to school and not getting a test for a few days and maybe not getting the results for another day or so kind of circulating now in classrooms with even more of their peers who are not vaccinated. Um, people are kind of scratching their heads wondering, you know, you trained us well on the seven day, get a test after seven days. So now it's, it's less than half that time now. Can the, can the test pick up whether someone has the virus after three, you know, with a, that three day wait? Um, and what's the, what's the risk here as far as, you know, it being elevated now with them being able to circulate without any you know, staying home and waiting for a test. Dr. Levine. Yes, well, a lot of thought has gone into this. Uh, I, I want people to be aware there are many states where there have never been any real travel policies in terms of hmm. quarantining or testing in or out of uh, quarantine policies. Um, <clears throat> and they actually, many of them have had schools going for a long, long time as well. So with that as backdrop, uh, the reality is that we are still, number one, telling people very clearly that the universal guidance that we've talked about it is in place. The little rhyme you just heard uh, from the previous caller um, hasn't gone away. And indeed, if you're actually outside the borders of Vermont, uh, one needs to be potentially even more careful about adhering to that guidance, knowing that the state may have different uh, rules and regulations compared to uh, what Vermont has. So we're counting on people doing that as part of the way they vacation, whether they're vacationing out of state or within the state. That's uh, very, very important. In addition to that, yes, you can pick up things three days after somebody's exposure. Um, we always are concerned about the fact that people may have been exposed in the two days prior uh, to them uh, to being in contact with a person who was infective. So um, adding that window of time in as well um, lengthens that a little bit. People are not supposed to return to their work environment or school environment if they have any symptoms. <clears throat> so whether you have obtained a test or not obtained a test, whether the test is positive or negative, if you have symptoms that are even close to COVID symptoms, such as sneezing and runny nose and nasal congestion, um, you should avoid going back to the setting where you could potentially infect others. So none of these things have changed at all. Uh, the only thing that's changed is the absence of a quarantine requirement. We are now, amongst New England states, still in the most um, aggressive, if I could use that word, for requirements on Vermonters coming back into the state uh, in terms of having a testing requirement at all um, and uh, that kind of a travel policy. So we feel pretty comfortable with that at this time. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I guess I was thinking more about the, not so much workers, um, adult workers going back to their workplace, et cetera, but mm -hmm. kids being um, as asymptomatic as they've shown to be, that it's kind of hard to know. They may not have symptoms, but they could potentially have been exposed um, or even have the virus, you know, be carrying the virus at that point um, before they're tested. And so, um, it just sort of is a little bit more of an unknown, I suppose, until they're able to get their test and hope that they're, um, I guess they're still using the masking strategies in school and, and some distancing as well to try to reduce their contact with other people. Yeah, no, and, and I can extend my discussion to them as well because uh, as Secretary French uh, has provided each week with his astonishingly low levels of positivity rates in the tests of school employees, they are one of the most um, careful populations living in the state, I would contend. Uh, even though we're not testing every one of them all of the time, uh, we're getting a good sample from the pre-vaccine era into the vaccine era now, and we're finding very, very low rates. So uh, assuming 
all of their care and beha careful behaviors continue through the uh, spring break, which I have no doubt they would, I think that also is on everyone's side. I don't know if Secretary French wants to add to anything I've said. No, I think, you know, Dr. Levine, you covered it. It is, um, you know, it is, it is a challenging time period, I think, you know, to bring together uh, the changes in guidance with the operational uh, realities today. And, you know, again, I just hearken back to the fact that we've we've navigated several of these sort of transition periods uh, throughout this year. We've done it well. Uh, there's always times of, I want to say, turbulence of difficulty in implementation when we come to one of these transition points, and we're clearly in it now. Um, but I, again, I would just point to our demonstrated uh, track record of, of operating our schools safely, and it does require all hands on deck to do so. But uh, we pulled together as a state to sort of do that very well, from my perspective. And, and if Secretary French, when as you're talking about writing out the turbulence, if after um, the schools reopen after their break periods, whether it's in the next week or the week after, um, if they see that there are cases popping up. Um, among their, their students, given some of these changes that are implementing, they have the ability to, at that point, reassess, correct, as far as like how they're, how they're conducting their, their operations, whether they're still doing the three feet or six feet, or whether they're remote or, or not? No, uh, really, you know, their uh, sort of tactical control is around their operations, you know, and staff availability and so forth, all those logistic pieces. Uh, but we've made that distinction all along. Again, it's sort of a key ingredient of our success is that we have been very directive on what are the sort of non-negotiable health standards that all schools must follow, but we do defer to them on how that gets implemented to a certain extent, particularly on how it impacts their daily operations. But I think, again, you know, just looking at sort of reflecting back on these moments where we've had transition, I think that you know the big the big point now is that we have the vaccine and we have real science and data behind the vaccine and we can see that in data from other places in the world like Israel where you know vaccine has made a significant impact on the trajectory of case counts. So we know with significant confidence, I think that uh, in spite of the variant activity, as, as Dr. Levine mentioned, we know there's going to be a significant uh, decrease in case counts here, and certainly we have been hoping for that to start sooner, but. Um, it's inevitable, I think, you know, uh, from my perspective, that uh, as we get closer and closer to that 50, 60, 70 percent vaccination rate, uh, that our communities will become much safer and therefore our schools will become much more safer. Um, but I think we're on the right track and it's just it's, it's just a challenging moment as we make the transition and guidance. So we appreciate that. And I know everyone's working together to make it work for people. Okay, thank you. Um, have a good weekend, everyone. All right, thank you very much, and we'll see you again on Tuesday. Have a wonderful weekend.